Good evening, and welcome to the December meeting of the Linnaean Society of New York. I'm Debbie Mullins, the president, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. We're glad you're joining us tonight for what I know will be a very interesting program. Well, it's been a really amazing couple of weeks for rare birds in our area. I hope you've been able to get out and see some of them. The red flank blue tail found in New Jersey last week is probably the most amazing find. This tiny bird breeds in Northern Russia and winters in Southeast Asia. It made its way all the way to New Jersey. The black chinned hummingbird found on Randall's Island on November the 15th was the first record of this species in New York state. And it's still there today, thanks to the park workers on Randall's Island who have put out a feeder for it. An ash-throated flycatcher, a dick sissel, and a western tanager have been seen in Manhattan for a week or so. And a western tanager and uh, other vagrants spotted include um, the, a Brooklyn ash-throated flycatcher, the tufted duck on Fort Pond in Montauk, an Audubon subspecies of the yellow rumped warbler and a western, king, uh, western flycatcher in, uh, at uh, Jones Beach, a mountain bluebird at Cedar Beach, a McGillivray's warbler at Oak Beach and Staten Island, and multiple orange crowned warblers and painted buntings. Hopefully these birds will stick around for the Christmas bird counts. Last week, you were asked to vote on two motions, one to approve the minutes of our November membership meeting, and the second to approve the membership applications of new members. The minutes of the November membership meeting were approved by a vote of 130 in favor, none opposed, and two abstaining. I'm pleased to announce that two people were approved by the membership as new members of the Linnaean Society. The vote was 132 in favor and none opposed. Our new members are Canelma Perez, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper, and Savannah Kennedy, also sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper. Welcome, Canelma and Savannah. We're very happy to have you as new members of the Linnaean Society, and I hope you'll get involved in some of our activities going forward. We're excited to get to know you. If you're not a member of the Linnaean Society, I urge you to join. The membership application is on our website, linnaeannewyork.org slash members. If you need a sponsor, please feel free to list me, Debbie Mullins, or any of our board members as your sponsor. Our membership, our sponsorship requirement is not intended to be a barrier to membership. Everyone with an interest in birds and natural history is welcome to join. Tonight, we're pleased to have Dr. Brian Smith of the American Museum of Natural History as our speaker. Dr. Smith is the curator in charge of the Department of Ornithology and associate professor of the Richard Gildner School Graduate School of the American Museum of Natural History. Dr. Smith holds appointments at Columbia University and City University of New York. He received his BS and PhD degrees from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas at the Marjorie Barrick Museum and was subsequently a postdoctoral fellow at the Louisiana State University Museum of Natural Science. He's an active, he leads an active research group that conducts expeditionary field work to study the evolution of birds using genomics and specimen-based techniques. By studying birds from around the globe, he aims to discover the patterns and ultimately the processes that underlie the origins of birds. He's a proponent of using the global museum to play a fundamental role in the study of biodiversity in the past and present in order to build awareness about the natural world and the threats it faces. The title of his talk tonight is Insights into Avian Evolution from Natural History Collections. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Debbie, for that introduction. <clears throat> and uh, thank, I would like to thank uh, Doug for the invitation and Michelle for all the support. Let me 
share my Can everyone see hear me and 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 see the the first slide? Yep, looks great. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm I'm really excited to to be here tonight to sp speak with you, and I'm going to give a really broad overview of the research and, and what it's like to work in a natural history museum. And I, and I really want to start with a, an institution we're all quite familiar with the AMNH, obviously the New York Linnaean Society and AMNH have had a really long story relationship. And what I hope to do with the start of, of this talk is kind of give you a behind the scenes look at what we actually do there. Um, there's a lot of talk about natural history museums. You hear a lot about them, um, but a lot of what we actually do is, is kind of behind closed doors and, and you don't always get to hear about it. And I'm going to give you some insights into an expedition we just did um, last month. And in the context of, of the research we do, and then some of the, the broader extensions of this type of work and, and, and what Debbie discussed in the introduction of understanding the, the origins of living birds. Okay. So last month, um, we did a, a joint expedition um, with colleagues in Mex Mexico City at the um, National Economist uh, University. It's the largest university in the world. They have a very prolific uh, natural history uh, museum there. They actually have two uh, bird collections on the same campus. Um, but we have some wonderful colleagues there we've been working with for a long time. And the objective of this trip was to do some surveys uh, in these two areas that are really close to the Guatemalan border. You can see highlighted in the red um, box. One was about a thousand meters uh, in a working um, coffee plantation called Finca Irlanda. And the other was um, in this small uh, town called Chicoites, which was about halfway up uh, Volcan uh, Takana, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay. And so here's just an image of the type of work and, and the, the team we have here um, setting up mist nets. Um, we're, we're, this is this isn't a, a little plot of vegetation that's adjacent to the, the coffee plantations. Most of the, the forest has been cleared for the coffee, but there's little patches and they have really rich uh, bird diversities in these, in these areas. Um, here's some of the just a couple examples, some of the really cool birds we found. Uh, Red-legged honeycreeper here, Cyanerpes cyaneus. Here, here's a young male bird. Uh, here's this beautiful uh, sparrow, white-eared brown sparrow, uh, Melazone lakotis. It's a, it's a little wet there, but it, it's quite a striking uh, sparrow. Um, now I'm going to take you to the, the next locality we went to, and, and this is this area I mentioned called um, Volcan uh, Takana. You can see this in this far image um, on the left of the screen. We're, we're in a, a city that's, at the, the, that's um, fairly close, but still pretty far um, to where, where we're actually going. You can see how, how large um, uh, this mountain is. It's the second largest peak in, in Central America. It is an active volcano. The last, um, um, what do you call it, eruption happened in the 1980s. It, it wasn't very dramatic, but it's still considered an active uh, volcano and, and it's potentially dangerous to the, to the large number of people that live adjacent to it. Some of the roads up the volcano uh, were quite primitive. Uh, so it was a trip to get up there. Um, here's a a look at the, the town of Chicoites. Um, it's a small community of mostly um, people living um, uh, subsistence lifestyles. They do some agriculture. There is there's some birding tourism in the area, and that's that's the individual that that we worked with who runs uh, tours up the volcano. Um, but it's a nice little town, quite quite pleasant area. Um, one of the benefits of these trips are, are just the, the amazing food and cultural experience. And so here's the team. We're, we're um, eating dinner in, in the 
at the, the local bird tour guide's uh, house um, and just having a, a wonderful meal here after a long day, okay? And so along the volcano, there are, like any tropical mountain, you have these elevational bands where the birds uh, turn over. And about a thousand meters up on the volcano, um, there's this really spectacular um, tanager, the Azor rump tanager here. You can see an image here from eBird. There's only two species in this genus. Um, and we actually went to this, this area and we were misnetting all day and we did not we did not um, see it all day. And then I, I was up much higher up the slope and someone came up and said, said they saw it. And so we ran down, down, ran down slope really quickly. We, we set up this mist net um, uh, to try to capture it. We were trying to get a blood sample. There's no genetic samples of this bird um, available, um, but the birds never hit, her, hit our nets, but they, they came quite close, but it was still, uh, pretty spectacular seeing this bird. Um, along the volcano, especially in November, uh, there are very, very high numbers of migrants. And so these are lots of birds that you would be um, familiar with, just birding around um, uh, the eastern U.S., black and white warblers, indigo bunting, Tennessee warbler. I, I watched a mixed flock of warblers in trees. There, there was easily the mixed flock went on for about four or five hours. It was it was really remarkable to see the the density of migrants um, uh, in this area. Um, one of the common resident, one of the most common resident birds, uh, the, the common Chlorospingus, shown here, um, quite a striking bird. And here's a view of. Our, our base camp where we were staying. And as I mentioned, you, um, we were we were doing surveys at these different elevations and, and the roads in this area was, was were pretty limited. Um, and this is kind of the end of, of the main road. You can go up to a couple houses, but at the top of, of this area, you can see the very top, that's the summit of the volcano. Right below that, you're going to get um, pine forest, and then it's going to drop further down. It's going to be a mixed pine cloud forest, and then it's going to transi transition into a pure a cloud forest. And, and there's some uh, really spectacular birds um, up there. Um, so here's, here's a view as um, we're working up the slopes. You can see that those are all the clouds down there. We're, we're way above um, the clouds. Um, far out into the, dis the distance is going to be the Pacific Ocean. And um, one day we had the opportunity to try to get up as high as we could. We were, we were our base camp was about 2,000 meters. Um, the top of the, the summit is about 4,000. It was about a six hour hike from where we were. Um, but a group of us, we went up there, we climbed about a, a thousand meters in the dark. We started at four in the morning and we surveyed the birds um, um, all, the, all day up there. And it, it was quite spectacular. Um, here's some just views of uh, what the landscape uh, look like going up this transition uh, when when the, the the sun finally rose. You can see the clouds are a um, little higher now, but uh, definitely um, in the clouds. You can see uh, the, this bird very common up, up in these elevations. The pink uh, pink headed uh, warbler is just a spectacular uh, warbler. Um, this this type of work is is quite challenging. You can see here we have um, we have on, on one side we have uh, our colleague and, and soon to be um, working at the AMNH, um, uh, Sahid Robles. We have uh, in the middle we have El Contenario, who is a PhD student and a Fulbright uh, scholar at the museum, and then we have Augie Kramer, who is uh, a museum specialist at the AMNH, and so. Uh, here we're either setting up or putting up mist nets um, in the dark on some pretty uh, steep um, 
landscapes. Okay, and one of the the things I want to end with this section of the talk is is uh, is quite frankly a is a unicorn uh, of the birding world. Uh, this really spectacular bird that that occurs in really uh, high elevations. You can see its range down here in the corner. It's a very limited range in southern Mexico and in, in Chiapas in these in these high um, elevation forests. And, and we were fortunate enough to, um, to get to see one. Uh, the the horn guan. It's a very large bird uh, that lives in the the canopy of these these upper uh, montane forests. Okay, so this is kind of an oversight of the the type of um, uh, work we do. Um, it's important for many reasons. We're getting out there. We're doing modern inventories of birds. We're providing training opportunities uh, for the next uh, generation of naturalists. Uh, we have these really strong international collaborations. These are, these are true uh, uh, collaborative projects and and really reflective of the state of modern museum research. Now, I want to now switch gears and talk about how this specifically fits into the AMNH ornithology collection. Uh, we collected these stats recently for a grant we put together, and some of them are, are uh, they're, they're, they're quite, they were surprising and, and, and quite impressive. Um, um, the Total number of specimens in the collections is just under uh, 900,000. It's 867,000 uh, plus specimens. If you break down that into different taxonomic groups, we have 100% coverage of families, 99% of coverage of genera, and almost 94% of, of species. So there is going to be some fluctuations here as, as, as uh, any bird in, bird audience knows that there's frequently changes um, to the rank, whether something is a species or a subspecies. And we, we do our best to keep up with that, but the, it, these numbers don't um, necessarily reflect um, all of our holdings, but they're the best to our knowledge. Um, the collection grows by about a thousand uh, specimens per year. Now these other ones are are some of the the broader impacts to the community. So we do about sixty two loans per year. We have about fifty six visitors a year, and they spend about two hundred and seventy days. And so that means about seventy five percent of the time we're having visitors from all over the globe um, come study uh, the collections. Uh, we also have um, collections uh, study grant program. Um, that provides funds for students. Um, they're primarily international students to come uh, visit New York and and uh, study in the collection for for a couple weeks. Um, we also have a lot of uh, tours that we give that we're calling non scholarly visits, which could be um, say an ornithology class coming to see the collection or or some uh, student groups. But the publication or the the stat that really impressed me when we put these together was this bottom one, which talks about 66 publications, uh, where, where 66 publications per year that use the collection. And so this is uh, data that we collected from uh, just the general literature. A anyone that is using the AMNH ornithology in some collection or in some capacity, uh, we were, were recording that. And we averaged over the last 77 years, 66 publications per year. And so that, that, that's quite a prolific number and really speaks to how important natural history collections, not just for the research that I'm gonna talk about shortly, but for the whole community. There's, there's a lot of work and, and this work spans from everything from new range records to taxonomic changes to comparative genomics and biogeography. It's a really wide range of topics. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears again, and I'm going to get into some of the specific applications of using natural history collections to study uh, avian evolution. And I want, I want to start off with this image of a blue-gray gnat catcher. Um, for any anyone that lives in this area, when we see the first blue-gray gnat catcher in the spring, it's always a welcome sight. But why I'm showing this is to provide context for, for 
how I approach my research. And so you take any of these individual species, they have an evolutionary history. They have some patterns of genetic variation. That genetic variation is distributed across the landscape and is interacting with a number of factors. And so really what my research group is, is trying to understand is what are those patterns and, and how have they arisen? And I'm going to get into a couple uh, specific case examples uh, just in a moment. Okay. And so these are some of the main areas in, in my uh, lab. Um, phylogenomics, which is the fancy word for we build evolutionary trees using uh, complicated statistical models and, and lots of data. Um, population genetics and phylogeography. We're really just interested in how genetic variation is distributed across the landscape and across the, um, uh, the genome. And historical DNA on the top is a lot of modern um, comparative work on avian evolution has to heavily rely on DNA that comes from century-old uh, museum specimens. And so my group spends a lot of time optimizing and developing methods where we can get the best quality data that we can from these old museum specimens, because it's quite tricky and, and it, it actually causes a lot of headaches. But the upside is that you are able to obtain data from very rare species or extinct species that you, that you normally would not be able to sample. Okay, now I'm going to give you a couple of um, couple vignettes on different research areas um, in my lab. The first is going to be on um, genetic variation in desert birds. Um, and so it's been well known that birds exhibit wide patterns of genetic variation across their ranges, across species. <clears throat> and this has been known for quite some time, but we're getting to the point now where we can just start to understand why a particular bird shows a particular pattern with respect to how its genetic variation is um, distributed across the landscape, across potential barriers that may impede how birds exchange genes. And, and I'm going to give into some examples in a moment, okay? And the system that I'm going to talk about are the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts um, in the southwest U.S. And, and northern Mexico, which is highlighted in this aqua uh, bluish color here. So on the western side, we have the, the, the uh, wetter and warmer Sonoran Desert and, and then Chihuahuan Desert um, to the east, which has much more extreme um, temperature fluctuations and, and less rainfall. And separating these deserts is this, this feature called the Cochise Filter Barrier, which is this upland, um, uh, really arid plateau that restricts gene flow um, for, for desert birds and lots of other organisms. And this has been a really dynamic barrier over time. Um, during glacial cycles, um, this barrier would have been quite different as the, the pine forests that are now restricted uh, to, to um, mountains in this area right now would have dropped down and, and changed the, the functionality of this barrier. And we'll get into more of this in a moment. Okay, now here's some images of the habitat heterogeneity that you can see in in the um, the Southwest deserts. Um, I mean, there's the the generic view of what a desert looks like. Would say be this um, in the bottom corner of this this saguaro cactus, and you see lots of small vegetation. But as you start surveying across this region, you you can really appreciate there's a lot of habitat heterogeneity. Um, and this has really important implications that I'll, I'll speak to um, in a moment. And this work that I'm gonna talk about was done by a former PhD student in my lab, uh, Dr. Kaya Provost, who's now an assistant um, professor at Adelphi University um, in Long Island. And uh, this work was, was um, for her PhD, 
PhD. Okay, and so here's some of the, the, the birds that um, she focused on. These are common uh, desert passerines. Um, we have, uh, for example, black-throated sparrow, one of the uh, most common desert birds. Uh, we have cactus wren, um, burdens, bells vireos, uh, pyroloxia, curb-billed thrasher, and so forth. So a wide variety of uh, desert passerine birds. Okay. Now I'm not going to go into all the 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 complications in the the, the genetic data, but I want to give you some basic overviews of the patterns that we found. And so you see these images right here. We have on the top, we have Bell's Vireo, in the middle, the black-throated sparrow, and the bottom, the Cathus wren. And so these circles represent uh, sampling localities where we did this, we did a, uh, essentially a transect from Arizona into uh, Western Texas. And these colors represent um, genetic assignments that were statistically determined um, to particular genetic groups. And what I mean by that is if you look at these circles and you can see, say here in the Bell's Vireo in the top where you can see we have a bunch of um, red individuals here mostly are mostly red circles. So that means the, oh, these Bell's Vireos in um, Arizona are, are genetically clustering and they're differentiated from all of these um, samples um, from Western Texas that have uh, mostly blue and, and this green. In contrast, if you look at the black-throated sparrow here, um, there isn't genetic um, structuring across this area, but there appears to be a uh, high degree of gene flow. And, and I'm seeing this because we see all the colors mixed up here. And so the birds from Arizona, from Texas are not very different. Okay, and so we did this for all these species. And really what we wanted to know is if we can use statistical models to predict how genetically different these birds were across the landscape. And we wanted to know, can we use the environment, um, for example, uh, precipitation and temperature differences across where these birds are to predict how genetically different they are. We also did this um, for geographic distance um, with the idea that birds that are more closely related to each other are more likely to, to breed. And this pattern can produce genetic differences among individuals just because of this non-random mating. Or it could be due to something like paleo um, climatic history. So changes in the climate over tens of thousands of years, and I'll, I'll tell you how we did this in a second. Um, does that predict the genetic differences we're seeing across birds? And then finally, what about the contemporary demography? All birders know, um, the abundance of a particular species changes when you go from one area to the next. And we wanna know, can that tell us anything about the genetic differences that we're observing in these birds? Okay, so for the paleoclimatic model, we use species distributional models. And so this is a way to make a prediction of what areas are, Old suitable climates uh, for particular species. And then I know there's a lot of colors on here, but the take homes are pretty, pretty straightforward. And so the one map we have here, um, Amphispiza violinetta, the, the black-throated sparrow. So these colors are just representing um, different model distributions of the species. And it, it, it matches the species distribution fairly well. And so we, all, we have different models being shown here. One is just the present only. And so that would be in this maroon color. We have another model where we're, we're projecting back in time to the last glacial maximum using climate conditions for back then, shown in this orange color. 
And then we have this overlap in this pink um, showing areas where the species would have been at both time periods. And so you can see here during 21,000 years ago, there was, there was a really strong contraction on um, species distribution down into um, northwestern Mexico, into the Baja, into the um, central uh, plateau in um, northern Mexico. Um, over here, we have the canyon towhee um, showing a, a slightly different pattern. So we want to use this to make some kind of some predictions for um, what genetic differentiation looks like. We did the same thing with this abundance data, but this time we're using the breeding bird survey data where there's these long-term standardized surveys of birds um, that can give you these interpolated values of bird abundances across the landscape. And so here we have the, the black-throated sparrow again, super common uh, desert bird, really high abundance um, across this area. Uh, versus crystal thrasher, um, which has a much more localized um, um, patchy distribution. And so I want to know these kinds of differences can make, um, provide any insight to genetic differentiation. Okay, this slide is very complicated. And these are, these are some of the main results. And, and I don't want to go into this that much, but I want to just show it in the context of, of explaining that we can start to differentiate the factors that explain genetic variation across the landscape. And that's what all these colors are representing. They're representing these different um, landscape models that I talked about. We have, um, for each row, we have one of the species and you can see all these numbers on the top. They're representing different chromosomes. But the real take home is that we can start to now have statistical support to understand why, say, the curve-billed thrasher has one genetic pattern versus, say, the Bell's vireo. We can, we can differentiate those in, in a, um, a statistical framework. Okay, so to wrap up this um, section, um, birds show a wide variety of genetic patterns across the landscape. I'm focusing here on the southwest deserts, but this is this is a universal ubiquitous pattern for any bird assemblage across the land, uh, across the globe. You're going to, invariably, birds show a lot of genetic variation when you look within communities. Um, the exciting thing now is that we have the tools to start to understand the why. Um, this is this work is really in its infancy still, uh, but it's it's really going to the direction for the mechanisms. Um, that inform us of what processes produce genetic variation. Okay, I'm gonna switch now to part two and talk about conversion evolution in woodpeckers. Now, all the birders watching this talk um, are, should be quite familiar with these two species. And I, I would bet even the best of birders watching this talk at times um, mix these two up um, because they can be tricky when you don't have, uh, the, depending on how far the way they, they, and the lighting, they can be quite easy to mix up. Um, and this project that I'm gonna tell you about was done by another PhD student at Columbia University who, who was in my lab. Uh, Dr. Lucas Osha Marrera, who's now a uh, uh, postdoctoral fellow at the UMass Medical School and, and the Broad Institute. And he developed um, this project all on his own. And it's, it's, it's really cool finding. So let's get back to this system. Um, we have the hairy woodpecker here and the downy woodpecker. Okay. They are nearly identical in plumage. There's some differences um, in bill size and obviously body size. Now, this is no, this is no surprise to birders, as I mentioned. This, this is something you're going to run into all the time. But I want to get into some of the details of why this is, is a, such a um, cool system. So if we look at this evolutionary tree on the other slide of, side of the um, image, um, the one thing that stands out really quickly 
is these two species are not closely related to each other. There's a whole there's a whole bunch of other woodpeckers um, in this clade. Um, and there's an entire radiation of neotropical uh, woodpeckers that are that are just won't even fit in here. And so these species are non-sister species. They're nearly identical in plumage, and they share a common ancestor about eight million years ago. And what's also remarkable about them, they're largely co-distributed across um, the United States um, and Canada. The hairy woodpecker gets down through um, the, all the way down into um, Central America, but the, the, the downy doesn't. So these two species are largely sympatric across their range. They also show quite a bit of geographic variation in plumage colors. So, so as you go from east to west out, out in, um, um, in the western U.S., they get much darker. If you go up north, they get much larger, okay? And so the, these species are co-varying across space where they're both getting darker and they're both getting larger um, as you um, go north. The other factor to this story is during their evolutionary history, they were dramatically impacted by this massive glacier um, that covered a large portion of North America some 21,000 years ago. And so what Lucas really wanted to look into this study was, was the evolutionary dynamics that underlied um, their history to see if there are using similar pathways to look the same or whether they're using different molecular pathways, okay? So here's an overview of their genetic variation across the landscape. Um, they have really similar genetic variations. This is similar to what I showed before. The colors are just representing different genetic groups uh, across the um, uh, temperate North America. Um, this is a more complicated slide. It's just to show you that we can model their demographic history, how their population sizes are changing, how much genes they're exchanging um, over time. And in this area, they, they do show some, some different patterns of having uh, different histories on the landscape. Now, I wanna show just one real remarkable component of this study. Now, this is a very complicated slide also, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hone in on just one key point here. And so what these slides are showing are showing how different two populations are, okay? So this is gonna be comparing the Southeast down here in Louisiana versus Alaska, okay? And so all these little points are different portions of the genome. And as if you walk across going from the one to the Z, these are just different portions of the genome. And the, the, the thing you wanna take away, if you wanna take away one thing from this, is that some of these things have very high, or some of these points are very high, that these high peaks. And all these high peaks are candidate low side that may be under natural um, selection. And what Lucas was looking for is their shared peaks, um, both these species. And here's one gene um, that, that's quite, um, interesting. And these are these insulin-like growth factors. And you're seeing this right here in this highlighted box that's shown in um, blue that's seen in both in both the downy and hairy woodpecker. And why this is interesting is because these IGF genes are implicated in body size evolution. Um, they're linked to growth, development, and differentiation. They have been shown in other birds to be associated with um, body size in, in passerines, and they help explain variation in body size. And so this comparison, we were comparing the large Alaskan birds to the smaller Southeast birds. And these, this is one of the most dramatic um, peaks that we found. Now to wrap up this part of the talk, um, so these hairy and downy woodpeckers show these signatures of um, convergent evolution. Um, particularly in these IGF genes. 
that that could explain um, why we're having uh, these different body size variation across the, um, the range. This doesn't explain the convergence in plumage color. For example, having the darker birds out west. Um, I didn't go into that, but they appear to be using different uh, molecular pathways uh, to, to produce similar phenotypes for there. Now, the final part I want to talk about today is um, the evolutionary history of um, parrots, which is the group that um, I've been heavily focused on um, for the last decade. And we've been building a lot of genetic tools to, to ask um, some really interesting questions. And I'm going to give you an overview of uh, just a few snapshots of, of this research. Um, one um, is that, now this study is not restricted to parrots, but it includes uh, the U.S.'s only native parrot, the Carolina parakeet, that we all know went extinct in the early 1900s. And what we wanted to do in this study was to grab a handful of birds. Um, we have this one group of extinct um, North American um, birds, the heath hen, passenger pigeon, ivory-billed woodpecker, Carolina parakeet, um, and Backman's warbler. And then we have here just a group of um, birds that are still extant. And so what we did for all these birds, we got century old museum specimens. We um, isolated DNA um, from them, uh, collected genome-wide genome markers, and then we characterized and modeled their demographic histories. Um, and so what we found, um, in this study is that all these extinct birds, they show low genetic diversity, but their demographic histories um, were not dramatically different from a lot of these birds, from these birds that are living today. And so it really um, emphasizes that these loss of these charismatic uh, Nearctic birds was, was quite rapid and it was most likely due to human activities as opposed to some predisposed um, genetic pattern that, that the birds were, say, on, already on their way out. Um, here's another example of a recent study that was published a couple um, months ago, led by uh, Dr. Jessica Oswald. And this is a really um, cool study where it's combining um, archaeology, paleontology, and so surveying uh, the sub-fossil record of Amazon parrots across the Caribbean, um, sequencing DNA out of the out of these fossils, and then putting it together with living um, Amazon parrots to look at patterns in genetic diversity. Um, and really, one of the um, take homes from this is that prior to human coloni colonization of the area, the parrot diversity was much higher. Some of these uh, really restricted species, such as the Hispaniolan parrot was much more widespread and it made it all the way up into the Bahamas. Um, here's another example of a study we did where we're extracting color out of museum specimens. Uh, if you can see up in the top hand corner, we have a museum specimen of a brown lorry. We're going to, this is from a, just an image of the specimen, and then we're going to convert um, uh, the colors, the patches on this specimen to um, um, to a, a digital avian visual model. And then we're going to model how color has changed on the evolutionary tree. And so this is focused on the lorikeets and lorries, um, which are about as colorful as all birds combined. They're, they're really a spectacular radiation ranging from Blackbirds, the purple birds, the red and 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 rainbow colored birds. It's it's really spectacular uh, uh, radiation. And this work was led by uh, John Merwin, who who started this when he was a undergraduate at Columbia University. Um, now I'm going to wrap up this talk with just a couple more examples of of what we've been doing with parrots, and so. 
one of the major projects we've been working on and we published this came out this year was it was nearly completing the evolutionary tree of, of all parrots we have 96 percent of uh, species in here in in the in the order uh represented and we have a pretty robust evolutionary tree and now we're going to um try to answer some really interesting questions one of the first things we're doing um is revising the taxonomy so that it so that the names that we give these two different groups um, align with the evolutionary tree. But then we're also interested in species diversification, how color evolved, as I just mentioned, species limits, genome evolution. There's lots of interesting questions. I'm gonna show you a couple examples. Um, with respect to taxonomy, and so we're, we're about to submit a taxonomic revision of, of, of um, for parrots uh, next week. And one of the things that we're grappling with is um, when to rename a group. And we have some, um, there's some pretty uh, challenging problems that arise and it. It becomes quite arbitrary. And I just want to give you one example of um, not groups that we are renaming, but illustrate the, the problem. And here's an example of Amazon parrots. They're a really diverse group of neotropical parrots. There are some 34 species. Um, there's not a lot of debate um, whether a species belongs in the genus Amazon. It's pretty pretty well accepted. They they more or less um, all look similar. There, there are some some differences, obviously, but they all look the same. Now, here's another group that has a much shorter evolutionary um, history, and every species in this clade belongs to its own genus. Okay, there's, they're, they're all monotypic. Um, I have all the examples um, up here. And so this is a much shallower evolutionary radiation, but everything has a different name. And so we've been putting a lot of thought into what is going on here and why is the case. And, and it's quite clear when we name birds, we're really agnostic about the evolutionary processes that are driving the physical differences that that we focus so much as uh, as bird watchers or, or or ornithologists. Now I don't have all the answers to to, to this, but I'm just sharing this to, to highlight the problem. Um, the next group I want to focus on is this little group down here in the red, the the long-tailed parrots of Indonesia, New Guinea, and Australia. It's a relatively small um, group. But this is one of the common patterns we found in our study where we have these different evolutionary trees and they disagree. And we have to figure out why there is disagreement. Um, and so we have here on one side, we have uh, the red winged parrot here. On the other side, we have this genus Polytelis where we have the superb parrot on the top, the regent parrot and the princess parrot. And so depending on how we build the evolutionary tree, the placement of the princess parrot changes. And uh, this has important implications for not, not only what we, we call in this bird, but, but how this, this pattern evolves. And why this is really interesting, so here's, here's some images of the red winged parrot uh, and uh, two princess parrots. They're, they're, they're quite different. Um, just look at their tail morphology. It's quite strikingly uh, different. The princess parrot is one of the crown jewels of uh, Australian bird, and it's one of it's a very difficult bird to see that lives in lives in the outback. And what we think is happening here is that some six million years ago, the red winged parrot and princess, the ancestors of the red winged parrot and the princess parrot, after they diverged. We're exchanging genes. And so now a large portion of the princess parrot's um, genome has actually come from the red winged parrot. And we're still working through this, but it really highlights the, the complexity that is underlies um, avian evolution that we're, we're just trying to get insights into with, with the latest tools. All right, let's wrap this up. So What's the take home? What's the importance of natural history collections? Um, I would argue, and I think the evidence is, is pretty compelling that traditional museum research is more important now um, uh, than it ever has been. The number of um, large scale 
all the way down to, to really minute academic questions are, are of critical importance for a number of reasons. And natural history museums provide the forum, the physical space to carry out these questions. Um, this includes continuing traditional museums, such as expeditionary work that I talk in, talked about at the beginning, documenting biodiversity, building international collaborations and training the next generation of scientists. And finally, modern museum research is really cutting edge. And, I'm, and this is just a general feature of um, museum research and I'm not specifically talking about my research. It's, it's, there's some really, really cool stuff that's going on right now. And uh, much of it I did not talk about uh, today. And a lot of it deals with taking advantages of it advances in genomics and computational biology and imaging. With that, I would like to um, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, so, um, Brian, thank you very much. Um, as uh, my job as vice president of the Linnaean is is to uh, um, is to uh, monitor the uh, the uh, mediate the questions and and uh, and answers, and um, uh, so I'm encouraging. We have lots of participants. I encourage you to uh, you know send in questions. Um, and uh, while I wait for people to to send in some questions, I don't see any here um, quite yet. Um, I have a a a couple um uh and th that occurred to me one one was um i was fascinated by the story of the of the woodpeckers the hairy and downy woodpeckers in which um in which as you pointed out although they're not very closely related they have very similar color patterns and also they 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 both vary geographically in the same way um and and i believe that's not the only case in woodpeckers am, am i right that there are other examples of yeah, no, pairs, of very, pairs very, of species that look very much alike but are not actually closely related i think in india and some other parts of the world do you, could would you want to comment on that or am, am i yeah, right there, there, it's there there are cases there are a number of cases or actually there's a really there's a really nice study by alia miller who who really um dug into that system and 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 um looked into it and so the, the idea is that you have this social dominance dominance mimicry where you have the more dominant species though in this system would be the hairy woodpecker and then the the, the downy woodpecker is mimicking the, the the hairy to have the advantages of of looking like a like a hairy woodpecker and so the idea would be that um if a hairy was was too far away and it was flying in and it saw a bird that looked like itself, it might not go uh, compete for a resource. And so, obviously, the 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 distinction is going to break down the closer the 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 the, the birds to get together. But um, demonstrating that empirically is, is really hard. One of the things we're looking at right now is whether there was gene flow between the hairy and downy woodpecker um, really early on in their history where there was a transfer of plumage genes that may explain why why they um, they look so similar. I mean it's mim mimicry in birds is I mean there's in Ramphophastus toucans um, there's a number of cases of mimicry it's just they're, they're really unbelievable. Okay. I just want to follow through on that, and then we do have some some questions. But um, it would seem to me, so you just in, in something you just said, just implied that like maybe the downy evolved to look like the hairy, and of course we could also imagine conversely. Well, no, maybe the hair, maybe the hairy evolved to look like the downy, and can you tell from looking at a phylogeny and the color patterns of the close relatives of the downy woodpecker and the hairy? Um, whether the downy basically did the downy whether whether one of them originally had the black and white coloration 
that the other one converges toward. In other words, which which might have been the model that the other one then evolved to mimic. I, I think the the phylogenetic data is can only get you so far because modeling ancestral phenotypes. Um, I mean, we've all you see an evolutionary biology paper, you're going to see it all the time. Um, what is not what's under the hood there is there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so I don't think the phylogeny is going to reveal much to the degree of the directionality if you, mm. of, of how these patterns um, evolve because they are, they are in uh, sister clades. Um, so I think the phylogeny is going to be pretty limited. For the lorikeets, we actually model what the ancestral lorikeet would look like. And we had an image, I, di I didn't show it, of what all what the ancestor to all of them using all that 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 color data and it's it's really tempting to build a story around that but but it really does not capture all the uncertainty that is there and that's it's really hard to visualize that uncertainty when you're just showing an image where you're saying this bird had green wings and a red breast that answers your question Okay, well, <laughs> you and I could talk more about this at some length, but I but we have we have a bunch of questions um, okay. coming in, and um, uh, one is, um, are you involved in the naming of birds? So the you, the, the the controversial political renaming, I'm not well, involved. I, in that. I, I, I'm <laughs> not going to try to interpret the the the, the meaning, the exactly what the question is, but I, I guess that yeah, I, I mean. I, Go ahead. We, yeah. we are we are proposing some new names for first parrots. A lot of them are higher level taxonomy. Um, we are we are proposing the the use of existing names that were that for various reasons are no longer in use. Um, say uh, an old name for a particular genus. Uh, we have a number of cases where we're proposing that we reuse uh, this old genus because now the phylogenetic information uh, shows it is valid. So, mm -hmm. so in that case, yes, um, um, I'm, I'm not involved in any of the, the renaming of the common names of birds. Right, but just the, the uh, scientific names and, and the families or family yeah. or genus, genus names. Um, here's another. Um, uh, our audience would like to know how soon will your forthcoming publications cause changes in our life lists? Are you <laughs> going? Are you going? Are you going? Are you going to besiege us with lumps, splits, or reassignments? Um, the the well, questioner did use the word besiege, but that was mine. <laughs> so we fair we publish fairly frequently. Um, the way that bird taxonomy well, at least at least up until fairly recently has worked for for birds in the western hemisphere is new data is is published and then a proposal is submitted to the south american or north american checklist or 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 both and that committee evaluates whether there should be a, a change in the rack the rank of the taxon and so my part, I'm not on those committees, but my part in that process is generating the new empirical data. And um, in those papers, we can offer some suggestions on how to interpret the data, but ultimately those decisions lie with the, those checklist committees. So those are the ones who are uh, changing your list. But in general, I'd say the type of work I do um, shows compelling evidence that species diversity is is currently really underestimated um, with the current current um, recognized species. So, so you so you think the AOU, the American Ornitholo Ornithologist Union, should split a lot a lot of the species that we birders are are used to seeing, and so that um, we'll be, you'll be building our life lists. I, I, the, the short answer is yes. I could give a whole other, whole other very uh, <laughs> philosophical topic on on that talk. I'm, yeah, I'm sure we could. <laughs> and probably, 
I'll, I'll bet, and I'll bet we would find ourselves disagreeing. But <laughs> on to the next question: How do how do you find ranges of species from the last glacial maximum? How do you know what their ranges were, like the original range of the Eskimo curlew during the mid Pleistocene, and how it changed over a hundred thousand years? But in general, yeah, the, how 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 do you infer uh, the uh, past distributions of, of of a species? Okay. Yeah, this is this is a great question. And so we do not to start off, we do not know their actual ranges during the past. Okay, we don't there are for some taxa, there are fossil records where there's clear evidence that say a bird was found in this area and now it's no longer there. And so that that's the real strongest um, um information um we have about actual hard evidence of past distributions. What I was presenting are, are called species distributional models. And so what goes into this is you have current observations of where birds occur. And so if you were in Central Park, um, so a blue jay, you'd have a record of there. And then you do that across where the species occurs. And you build a model using climatic data, so different um, measures of precipitation and temperature. There's there's all kinds of um, permutations on on those two metrics, and then you build a model which is going to tell you where is suitable climatic areas for that particular species. Okay, um, it's not necessary. It's a statistical model, so there, there is uncertainty there. And then what you can do is you can get a climatic model, say, of the last glacial maximum, where they have um, inferred what the climate conditions were in different areas. And there's lots of ways uh, that they do that. But then you take your contemporary model and you project it onto that past climate. And then that gives you an idea of what areas were suitable and what areas were not suitable. It doesn't necessarily say this species was here versus that, but it gives you an indication that some of these, these areas were probably quite unsuitable for this species because it was either too hot or too uh, wet in the past. Right, so yeah, so um, make it clear that they, um, that the the climate models that is the 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 projection of where which regions had what kind of climate in the past obviously doesn't come from ornithologists it comes from climatologists and i guess uh, paleo you know whatever paleoclimatologists yeah so yeah no that's that is um, very cool and of course and of course the um you might be able to to uh you find botanists who are doing similar kinds of studies of plant distributions, and and it would be interesting to cross check inferences about bird distributions and plant distributions and see if, how those might correspond in the past to associations that you see today. I wonder, I'm not sure if anyone's done that. I haven't heard. Of I don't that. know if anyone's done it to that degree, but what gets really tricky where they have they have a good fossil record, say of a bird assemblage. And, and what has been shown in a number of cases is that birds are living in non-analogous communities. Mm -hmm. And so we have an idea of where, a, what type of habitat a bird should be, what the other species that are going to be in the community, let's say when we go out and, and bird watch, you look at these fossil records and, and for some of these assemblages, and this is say a thousand, two thousand years ago, or maybe going back to the last glacial maximum, and they're in habitats we would not expect to find them in, and they're with birds we would not expect them to be with. Which also, you know, I mean, that was found long ago by by people looking at the past dis distributions of plant species and finding that what we think of today as certain consistent associations between certain species of plants actually is relatively novel. And if you went back, you know, 20 or 100,000 years, you would find that those species didn't form the same the same kinds of assemblages. Um, here's a question. What anatomical place or bones or feathers are best for you for useful DNA with old museum bird bird species. Where do you, where do you get your DNA from when you go into the, the museum collection? 
So we 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 get it from the toe pads and the bottom of their feet. There's a little little sliver of skin that we cut off. It's very, very small. We actually just did a very thorough experiment where we're we're now working with fluid specimens, which are much more complicated to get DNA. And we sampled all these different tissue types and um we found it was the toe pads again, even in these hundred year old uh fluid specimens that the toe pads have uh the most DNA. By fluid, you mean that specimens in in alcohol? Yeah, they, these are specimens that were that many of them were preserved in formalin, which is, causes all kinds of problems for DNA. And now they're currently in in ethanol, so they're much trickier specimens to get DNA out of. But it's possible. Okay. Um, next question. Great talk, thank you. Incredible coverage of the AM and H co collection. Those percentages are amazing. Thank you for your work to steward these important reserves of information and keep them available for study. So that was a not a question, but a compliment that I think is widely shared. Thank you for the kind words. And next, um, uh, next it suggests mimicking implies intent. It would seem to me that birds start looking and acting alike because that is what works best, not because they realize that that is the case. Yeah, I, I yeah I think it's a, I think it's a passive process. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I would agree. Yep, I mean it's a result of natural selection, just you know, <clears throat> just like their size or you know or their their behavior or anything else. Okay, next, thank you, Brian and Linnean. How many birds did you collect on your southern journey, and did you collect anything new for your specimen catalog? Um, we. I'm not going to reveal the numbers that we, we we collected just because it could be controversial, but I would say um, we did not collect a large number of birds. The permitting is 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 um, quite limited in what you could take. I will say ninety percent of the birds that we caught we we let go. I hope I hope you can respect um, that that response. Next question. A recent article I read says the this this um uh, uh, member. Uh, recent article I read based upon computer modeling bird spe bird genes found too much ambiguity in structuring bird species into trees. The answers seem to be more interbreeding than originally expected, meaning t trees are too simple a model. Um, Yes. Yeah. Would you, would you like to comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think what the the um, the individual is getting at it is is what many of us and it's not just with birds are really grappling with. We had this general idea that evolution was very clean and it would bite you would get a bifurcation. You'd have a species was would split and they would go off on their evolutionary trajectory. And that's kind of been the dominant paradigm for say 30, 40 years. Um, but lo and behold, now we have a lot more information and this comes from whole genomes. And so the resolution of what we, we have now is giving us really unprecedented insight. And, and what we see very often is that idea of a bifurcating tree does not hold up and that um, birds all throughout time exchange genes, and this is not just with closely related species that are in the process of speciation, but this is among um, what we call non-sister species. So these are species that are not closely related, like the example of the red-winged parrot and the, the princess parrot. And so what this means is that um, the tree of life is not a clean tree with branches that keep splitting but it's a it's more likely a network or, or a web it's, it's a very exciting time to, to study these questions um uh, but it's also it's from a computational standpoint it's very tricky 
I think you and I could probably have a, a long conversation about that because <laughs> we're going to have a lot of, we're gonna have a lot of talk, Doug. Certainly not, certainly not as cleanly bifurcating as we might have thought, you know, back when I when I was a graduate student. But it is bifurcating. There are just occasionally little, you know, there, <laughs> there certainly can be trickles long after the between between uh, lineages, long after they really have 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 uh, separated. Um, um, I um, I had one or two other questions. Well, let me just ask one question that relates to the 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 uh, uh, what's done with specimens in museums, which is that um, that. Uh, you know, I and quite a few other birders in this in this area, if we find a dead bird, you know, it's a you know, car struck or a window strike or something like that, you know, I take it home and I put it in my freezer and eventually I bring it in and give it, you know, give it to to Paul Sweet for for the collection. And um and Paul Sweet, the collection manager, is, you know, is very happy, in fact, eager to get specimens like that of species that certainly are already very well represented in the collection. Um and uh, but but uh, some Paul sometimes will actually sort of go go on the chat lines and and urge people to bring in specimens that they find. And my question is, you know, given the number of specimens that the that the um, music that the collection already has, you know, what is the value of adding adding specimens today <clears throat> of species that are already well re represented in in the collection? Yeah, that, that that's a that's a fantastic. Um, question, and I, th I think it'd be analogous to um, if you went to a really good library that has many good books, what would be the value of add adding new books? You, no one would argue that we shouldn't add new books because there's, there's there's really important um, books that always come out. But it really it really comes down to natural history collections. Um, we're documenting biodiversity and. On one end, we want representatives of all, of all life out there, and that can answer some questions, but there's all kinds of questions that need different information. Um, and so having temporal series of bird specimens um, is very, very critically important. Um, like, for example, the Field Museum has been collecting window kills for the last um, 30 plus years where they go around, they collect every bird that hits a window and then they, they prepare specimens from them. They have accumulated a massive series. These are all very, very common birds, the majority of them. And they've found some pretty remarkable patterns that are shown um, how the, the body sizes of these birds have just changed in the, in, in the last 30 years. And that's, that's really? consistent with the changing um, climate. But yeah. our, our general philosophy is, is that we're, we build the collection as a community resource. It's not for my particular projects. I obviously do my own projects and, and I, I bring in specimens for those projects, but we're working for the broader community and um, we let them come up with the questions and we're going to let the future generations. So the more that we can document uh, biodiversity, the the better that these collections um, can serve um, future future questions. And, and this is particularly troubling. And we're going through a period of time of the most dramatic um, climatic and uh, biodiversity changes uh, in, in a, quite some time. But in the last 50 years, um, the growth in natural history collections has been quite, it's been abysmal, frankly. Um, even if you look in the United States, there are places in the United States very that aren't near natural history collections where people haven't collected for 80, 90 years. And it's mm. it's it's a huge wasted opportunity. Um, and I think future generations are really going to be scratching their heads. Um, mm -hmm. No, thanks. I think that that's a, a very, very illuminating answer. Um, uh, we have one one more question from the audience. Um, and this goes back to what we what you mean by trees not bifurcating. So the um, so the um, the uh, um, Chuck asks not bifurcating might now mean we have birds that are two parts cardinal, three parts goldfinch, and six parts telly. <laughs> is that what you mean? No. What I what I mean by that is 
is when you look at genomes of, of birds, they have, so the general idea is that there's this single evolutionary history. And as, as avian evolutionary biologists, we're trying to figure out what was that single evolutionary history. But when you start sampling across genomes, you realize that they're a composite of many different evolutionary histories. There's all kinds of factors going in there. Um, and the simplest way is, is say if you just walk across different portions of the genome, the evolutionary tree is changing. And so what this indicates is that there's been a lot of, uh, one of the things that it indicates is that there's a lot more gene flow than, than we originally um, appreciated. And so I think it's, it's a little more nuanced than say that they're that a cardinal has part chickadee in it or, or something to that effect. I, I think that that a cardinal is still still a cardinal and we can, we can be confident in that, but it's, it's evolutionary history is a little more complicated than we realized. Right. I mean, what you would see, for example, if you, you know, if you looked at say indigo bunting and lazuli bunting, which we know it's hybridized to some extent, you would find here and there in the genome of an indigo, of an apparent indigo bunting, you might find a gene that is more typical of the lazuli and vice versa. And you yeah. might even find a gene that is typical of blue grosbeak, a more distantly related species, but in the same, the same species yeah. cluster. So that, that's pretty much what you mean, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's, but it, it's, there are, there are some invertebrates where the majority of a species genome is from another species. Um, oh, I'd like to know about this. Okay. <laughs> None of that, no. <laughs> yeah, there, there, and I think we're going to start finding in birds where, say, 40% of the genome comes from another species. Okay, that's, that, that, that would be very intriguing. Um, <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? I don't uh, think so. Um, I was trying to see whether I had any more questions. Oh, here's one. I just, you know, um, uh, well, maybe I'm more, I'm probably more attuned to this in some of your, your slides than, than some of the uh, members of the audience are. But when you were showing, um, you, when you were showing the degree of difference among spatial popu populations or species in what, what we call FST, um, that that differed for different chromosomes rather considerably. Do, you know, I, wouldn't you think that pretty much all the chromosomes with all the genes on them would have fairly similar kinds of patterns of difference be, in between samples from different places, different ge geographic locations? But what you were showing it was that... Um, uh, in the first part of your of your not the, in the second part of your talk was that sometimes different chromosomes would be much more similar to one another in different regions and other chromosomes would be more different yeah yeah this is another very exciting area in evolutionary biology um and and what this is called is the the landscape of genomic differentiation and so um one idea, say pre-genomics, would have been exactly the scenario you described, Doug, where where there's there is fairly uniform genetic differentiation across the genome. The genome is acting as a, a single unit. But what's pretty clear in nearly every example I, I've seen is that when you go across different chromosomes, the the degree of genetic differentiation from populations can be dramatically different. And in cases where you have really highly differentiated regions, these can be called um, the areas of the genome involved in speciation, where there, there's really strong selection just to maintain those genetic differences. There could be genetic incompatibilities, whereas other portions of the genome are going to be exchanging, say, across the, uh, across the hybrid. But this is a very active area of research of understanding yeah. why genomes differ, are so different across across the chromosomes. No, yeah, I agree. I think that's really intriguing. Um, just a, a couple of comments, you know, back on the issue of, of um, uh, whether trees are strictly bifurcating. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, one 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 well known member of our uh, audience says Neanderthals are an example, right? We're correct. And another um, says Noward and Black Duck are merging, an example of mixed genes. 
Yeah, Great. yeah, I, I think we we live in a, a world of, of of hybridization and and what we call ancient introgression. Right, that including including, I'm at least including me. Maybe not you. I don't know how many now. I got Neanderthals. You have, but yeah, I, yeah. yeah, right. We all. Have. <laughs> okay, I think if there are no uh, any last minute questions from your audience, uh, type now or um, or raise your hand or. Um, or we'll, I think we think we're at an end. Um, and um, uh, and Brian, I would like to thank you very much for giving us well both both the examples of what your personal research areas are. And I think you know several of those I would be I would be happy to hear a much longer you know complete exposition of. But also, and I think really importantly to um, I think you know to really that you've shown really what what goes on in museums, you know, what is the science that is being done in, you know, in ornithology in the American Museum of Natural History? And I think it's fair to say that you would find similar, you know, comparable kinds of studies happening in herpetology, entomology, ichthyology, you know, throughout throughout the museum. It's, it is really one of the most in, important, um, you know, centers of evolutionary and taxonomic research certainly in the United States, well, and, and the world, really. And um, I would think that you would be really happy to, you know, to, to be to be part of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for, for your talk tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Doug. This this was a lot of fun. And, and thank you, everyone, uh, for, for, for listening. Okay. With which we'll say good night to everyone. And thank you again. Bye. Take care.